Good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to the talk on uh, server SOC specification uh, standardization. I'm uh, with uh, Shanbhog. Uh, I chair the TG that worked on this uh, specification. Uh, I work for a company called Rebos. Uh, to start out, I would like to thank all the, uh, the members and colleagues at RBI who contributed, collaborated uh, uh, to making uh, this specification happen. Uh, to start with, uh, let me just try to uh, conjure up uh, a picture of a server uh, in your mind. Uh, what do you think of when you uh, think about a server? Uh, usually you think of a, a, a large machine uh, that has uh, you know, typically high performance, uh, lots of IOs, uh, lots of storage, uh, uh, and typically these machines uh, serve information or resources uh, upon request uh, to other clients. So uh, examples uh, include things like web servers and media servers, uh, inference servers, and so on. And uh, the other attribute you would see is a uh, lot of these uh, uh, machines are headless. They sit in uh, server uh, data centers, server rooms, uh, uh, away from being easily accessible. And uh, why that's important, I'll talk about uh, as we go later. Um, and. Uh, they also are expected to operate continually. They have higher uh, uh, expectation uh, as far as things like uh, reliability, availability, and serviceability is concerned, security, uh, performance, and uh, quality of service. So what we, uh, when we started out uh, on this uh, uh, exercise of uh, 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 you know, creating a server specification, the goal that we had in mind uh, was what is what's there at the bottom, uh, which is we want to enable uh, OS and hypervisor vendors to target uh, SOCs that are compliant with the specification with a single binary OS uh, image distribution uh, model. So we want uh, the image distributions to just load, boot, run uh, on these machines, and uh, there, there should not be much excitement around whether it will work or not work uh, on this machine. So we want to standardize the requirements for the hardware interfaces and capabilities that these SOCs provide uh, to software executing uh, uh, on, on the application processors. And we are going after a set of standard capabilities uh, uh, where divergence is typically not required and uh, there's not much uh, novelty. For instance, there's, uh, uh, while you can try to build PCIe in 10 different ways, there's usually not a need to do that. So, uh, what I want to stress here is that we're not trying to say there should not be innovation, uh, but uh, the types of things that we're trying to standardize here uh, fall into the category where innovation is not necessary. It's good to follow standards and be uniform and homogenous uh, across uh, systems so that uh, operating systems can expect a certain set of capabilities and hardware interfaces to be available uh, no matter which server they get uh, installed on. This is an important uh, picture that I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, and what this is trying to say is uh, the server SOC specification that we're targeting is uh, at this level in the whole stack. Uh, and it's trying to standardize the SOC hardware interfaces such as you know, PCI root ports, uh, IMMUs, and so on. Uh, but there's a complementary set of standards that we are uh, also developing around uh, this, and uh, we want to put them together to form what we call as the server platform uh, specification. So that's coming together. So the server SOC specification that we are, uh, uh, we'll be talking about today is an ingredient of this overall server platform, and uh, the overall server platform <coughs> incorporates uh, additional specifications for things like boot and runtime services. This is recipes for uh, you know, UEFI and ACPI and uh, you know, those uh, capabilities that uh, operating systems rely on. The security model that says how do I, uh, the recipes for how do I integrate a secure system uh, 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 to build a server. Uh, the firmware that initializes these uh, uh, SOCs. Uh, there's also uh, adjacencies such as the board management controller that manages uh, the sensors and uh, does the configurations of the, uh, the server platform. So we want to provide standardized interfaces. Uh, even though those are not visible to the software, they are very important for a server uh, to standardize upon. Right? So this collective of specifications, uh, the server SOC, the boot and runtime services, the security model, the platform firmware, the profiles, uh, together they form uh, a bigger picture of a server platform a specification. And what we'll be uh, looking at today is the ingredient, uh, which is the server SOC uh, uh, that sits here. So when I talk about uh, the RISC-Y server SOC specifications, there's a few different areas that we uh, touch upon, such as 
you know, how do I integrate the clocks, the timers, the interrupt controllers in the SOC, the IMMU, the PCI subsystem, RAS, uh, quality of service, manageability, uh, performance monitoring, and uh, security. Right? So I'll briefly touch upon uh, each of these areas uh, to call out what the, the specification is trying to uh, attempt uh, uh, in this space. It starts with things like uh, clocks, timers, and interrupt controllers. So what uh, the, uh, the server SOC specification uh, is uh, uh, requiring is uh, the use of the advanced interrupt architecture uh, as the, 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 the base uh, interrupt architecture uh, for, for the server SOCs. Uh, use of message signal interrupts. And uh, 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 it also goes ahead to specify things like uh, the unit of time being a nanosecond. So that's very important because uh, when you're uh, trying to build uh, applications for these server uh, uh, platforms, uh, you're trying to do migration of VMs across uh, servers, uh, you cannot have varying uh, units of time across these machines. And so having a standard uh, time base, having uh, a standard set of uh, interrupt uh, architecture, uh, having a certain minimum number of uh, you know guest inter files available uh, as far as your virtualization experience is concerned uh, specifying the minimum number of interrupt identities that must be supported so that uh, uh, is is important that's what uh, the uh, soc uh, specification uh, gets into the rules and uh, uh, guidelines around integrating clocks timers and interrupt controllers The other key ingredient uh, of the SOC is the RISC-5 IMMU. Uh, so we have a, a, a ratified uh, RISC-5 IMMU specification. And uh, it's important uh, ingredient to provide uh, memory protection, uh, address translation, uh, being able to share, uh, uh, you know, uh, having a shared virtual address between the CPU and the, and the host, which is becoming important for a uh, number of workloads, such as uh, AI workloads. Being able to do interrupt remapping and uh, virtualization. And so what the, the CPU MMU does for load store accesses from applications uh, from the host uh, on the core, the IMMU does that uh, equivalent functionality uh, for uh, you know, uh, memory reads and writes initiated by devices. And so the server SOC specification uh, requires all DMA capable peripherals uh, in the SOC uh, uh, to have a, uh, to be governed by a RISC-5 IMMU. Uh, it goes ahead to specify the minimum device ID weights, the passive weights, uh, you know, the, the, the support for PCIe uh, address translation services, and rules for integrating an IMMU into the host bridge, uh, you know, such as uh, uh, providing memory protection uh, mechanisms, uh, physical memory attributes, uh, interpretation of IDs, uh, and transactions, uh, and so on. So it goes into a detailed set of rules uh, uh, for integrating the RISC-5 IMMU into the overall solution. Um, the next uh, major uh, part of the specification uh, revolves around the PCIe subsystem. Uh, so uh, uh, the PCIe subsystem uh, for a server is uh, the most important I.O. complex. Uh, uh, and. Uh, it involves having a root complex, which is a, uh, a collection of root ports, a set of root complex uh, event collectors, and uh, uh, a possibly root complex uh, integrated uh, endpoints. Right? And these, uh, this root complex connects to the SOC through, the, uh, through a host bridge. Uh, and on the other side of that uh, host bridge, you have the, uh, the hearts and the memories. Right? So, and then you have a, one or more IMMUs in the root complex providing your address translation and protection services. Uh, around the PCI subsystem, uh, what the, uh, the specification provides is, again, rules for integrating uh, the root complexes into the server SOC, uh, goes into rules for, say, routing of uh, uh, config space accesses uh, and handling of completions, uh, uh, handling of um, uh, uh, memory mapped I.O. Uh, transactions, um, uh, rules for uh, ordering and uh, uh, coherence and cacheability, um, rules for errors and event uh, reporting, security capabilities such as uh, access control services, and uh, you know, things like precision time management uh, so that you can synchronize uh, time between devices and the host. Now, it also calls out certain common pitfalls when integrating uh, PCIe. For instance, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's common to pe uh, for people to forget uh, that, hey, if ARI forwarding is disabled, I should not uh, send config transactions beyond device zero uh, from the root port. OK, uh, and common mistake, but we call it out. Because uh, if you do in build a system with such an uh, uh, error, uh, it's very hard for software to work around uh, something like that. 
Uh, things like uh, uh, config space accesses, you want to be able to support one, two, and four byte uh, accesses. Don't forget to, uh, don't, don't just support four byte accesses because that's going to break uh, software. Uh, how do I handle poison transactions? Uh, so all these rules are uh, incorporated as part of the PCI subsystem integration uh, rules into the specification. RAS is a big focus area, and um, uh, it's becoming increasingly uh, important. Uh, so what is RAS? Uh, uh, so it stands for reliability, availability, and serviceability, where reliability says that uh, the system does, provides correct service. It does not give you wrong answers. Right? Um, and uh, availability is a, to a measure of uh, tolerance of errors, because you might build a lot of error detection capabilities, uh, but if you don't build enough error correction capabilities, then the system won't be available, because it may not provide you a wrong answer, but if it fails uh, uh, very frequently, then it's not a very usable system. And when it does fail, you want to know where the failure occurred and uh, how to uh, restore uh, correct services. So that's the serviceability piece. And, uh, uh, in this space, uh, RBI ratified the RISC-V uh, uh, RAS error record in, uh, register interface specification, or RERI, that provides a standard interface for software to uh, collect errors and uh, configure uh, information for uh, signaling uh, the occurrence of RAS errors, including their severity, nature, and uh, location. So while the, the RAS capabilities the, the itself is something that a product has to make uh, its own determination based on goals such as uh, fit rates, Typical servers have required, uh, you know, say, a fit rate of uh, uh, 100 fits for silent data corruption, which translates to about uh, 12,000 years of, uh, you know, uh, error-free operation, uh, or uh, 800 fits for detected uncorrected errors, which is about 150 years of uh, before you crash. Now, you might say 150 years is too long, but uh, 150 years, think of a data center having 10,000 uh, servers, uh, that's about five days uh, before a crash. Um, if it were individual machines uh, acting on jobs, that may not have been such an issue. Uh, but today, uh, we have things like distributed inference running on thousands of servers. And uh, they are all one job. And uh, if one job fails, uh, the whole collective fails. And uh, so RAS is becoming uh, extremely important. So the specification provides uh, uh, guidelines around uh, you know, error detection and correction mechanisms uh, being implemented for caches, memories, interconnects, uh, calls out a need for doing things like periodic scrubbing of memories. You've got large uh, memories, and uh, they will uh, accumulate uh, bit errors. Uh, you do not want uh, software to stumble into an error and crash. Uh, so having petrol scrubbing uh, type mechanisms. And error containment mechanism, because errors do happen, but you do not want those errors to escape uh, and get persistent over the network or into storage. Uh, so things like data poisoning and uh, containment, uh, you know, things like uh, enhanced uh, DPC uh, being utilized so that if an error does occur, it doesn't escape the system, it gets contained to the system. Um, and so you can uh, avoid, uh, you know, persistent uh, data corruption. The other main uh, uh, area of focus is quality of service. And uh, as you, uh, as I called out, server systems are large systems. They have uh, a multitude of cores, uh, uh, large caches, uh, shared interconnects. And this also leads to this issue of noisy neighbor, where uh, typically you, it's not just one job that's running. There are multiple jobs running on the server. And they cause interference to each other and leading to non-determinism in performance. Um, and uh, uh, to avoid the non-determinism, people might want to say, I just want to run one job. But that leads to an underutilization problem, because to meet the quality of service goals, uh, you are idling the server. And there have been reports of how uh, you know, uh, servers without quality of service can be uh, more than 70% you know, uh, idle uh, just to be able to meet that latency goals. Uh, so RBI ratified uh, two uh, specifications in this space, uh, the RISC-V SSQS ID, which provides a mechanism to associate an ID with a workload, and the RISC-V Capacity and Bandwidth QoS Register Interface, or CBQRI, uh, that provides a way to associate capacity and bandwidth allocation in these shared resources such as you know, caches and interconnects and memory controllers. Uh, and now, using these uh, capabilities, you can pair up uh, you know, uh, workloads uh, to their capacity allocation and have the system uh, ensure that uh, uh, the service level objectives are met. Uh, there is no undue inf interference from one workload to the another uh, workload that may be co-located on that server. 
So what the server SOC specification provides is uh, guidelines on uh, uh, use of uh, QoS techniques such as uh, uh, and the CBQRI specification uh, to address these uh, uh, you know, noisy neighbor and underutilization problem. Uh, it provides guidelines on the minim minimum number of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, resource control IDs and monitoring counter IDs uh, for it to be useful uh, to, uh, for use in a, a server system. Manageability is uh, again very important uh, for servers. These are mostly headless systems that sit somewhere in a cold, dark room, uh, which is not physically accessible. Uh, so if you need somebody to walk up to the machine to push a reset button, uh, that's a truck roll, very expensive. Uh, so manageability is needed for doing things like monitoring of sensors, temperature, power, uh, collecting RAS records, parameter controls such as setting uh, TDP limits, or even the initial provisioning of the server, such as provisioning credentials and so on. Uh, so the server SOC specification uh, 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 provides guidelines on in integrating uh, standard protocols such as the DMTF defined Redfish, PLDM, and MCTP uh, for uh, doing uh, manageability. Uh, it specifies the hardware interfaces, for instance, uh, to the BMC uh, to, uh, uh, to do things like uh, uh, remote KVM, uh, providing a management network, and uh, using these protocols for the, uh, the provisioning and operation, remote provisioning and operation of a server platform. Platform. 